Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to episode 12 of The Killer T. On today's episode, we'll be talking about John Edward Robinson, the slave master. master. We're your hosts, Chelsea and Christina. Welcome to the bullshit. And for the next hour, we will be the theirs of, ooh, uncomfortable feelings. Yeah, this dude, this, mm. Right. I was so uncomfortable researching this guy. So I have, Chelsea already knows, but I'm admitting to you guys, um, I had plans on properly researching this mall fucker, uh, but I ran out of time. So Chelsea is actually going to be really kind of telling me his story and I'm going to be reacting. So it's a little different format than what we normally do. I have my snacks. She's eating Cheetos, y'all. Fucking Cheetos. This is not a mukbang or ASMR. I'm gonna need you to put your snacks away. Mm. I feel like I'm gonna need just one more snack. Just one more Cheeto, real quick, and then we'll. That's a big fucking Cheeto. Okay, hold on. It's gonna take me a few seconds. I need comfort food for this. I saw a barrel, and I hate serial killers that pe- put people in barrels. Why are you ruining the story before we I'm even get there? I'm not ruining the story. We've already released the art. They've seen the barrels at this point. <laughs> I'm just letting you know. Hold on. I got to open my water again. Oh my God, you nasty bitch. <laughs> all right, just washed it all down. God, uh, I can only imagine how that actually sounds. You know, I need a drink. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. You had your chance. You have... In the boudoir today, we have a selection of Coca-Cola, Pepsi, alcohol, and Wawa. Oh, there's some chocolate in there if you get in your feelings as well. I'm always in my feelings. Always all up in my motherfucking feelings. Always in my feelings. So we actually are recording back to back this time. Um, And if we're going to end up being funnier in this, it's because this dude is fucked up and it's also 945. I've been at work since 11. I'm tired and I'm slap happy. And I've been working since 7 a.m.? Yeah. So yeah. It, we're tired and... I wrote 150 emails today for work. Ew. 150. That sounds horrible. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's my job. So, you know. I kind of want to snack again, but I'm not going to. I, uh, yeah. Don't snack. Let's just, let's just, let's just do it. Just the fucking thing. Let's, let's, just, just, let's just do, do the it. goddamn thing. All right. Well, tell me. Talk murder to me. Tell me a story. So. Oh, God. This motherfucker. What is his name again? <laughs> oh, my God. I'm kidding. I know <laughs> what his name is. I just tried to do the intro like eight times, and I kept fucking up his name. So, little John Edward Robinson was born on December 27th, 1943 in Cicero, Illinois. Cicero. <laughs> Lip shit. <laughs> it's just, uh, can anybody? You insert when you edit, can you put like a little clip of that in there? Because that would be. Number 17. <laughs> the split. <laughs> Is anybody music nerds here? Musical? Anyone? 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 In Chicago? Anyone? Catherine okay. Zeta Jones? Maybe. Maybe. Anyways. Okay. So he was born on December 27th, 1943 in Cicero, Illinois. He had it coming. (laughs) He had it coming. (laughs) Sorry. Okay, go on. (laughs) Do your thing. He was... (laughs) 
<laughs> the third of five children to Alberta and Henry Robinson. His father was an alcoholic. I know you're so shocked. Yeah. And his mother was a heavy disciplinarian. Also, also super so shocked. Shocked. So he had a pretty like normal childhood though. He was, you know, he had four siblings, not a lot going on. Normal-ish. I mean, his father was an alcoholic, but he wasn't, there wasn't really any abuse or anything like what that. What about religion? Was it super religious or anything? Um, I mean, he, he joined the Boy Scouts, right? And I'm already seeing parallels with John Wayne Gacy right now. There are some. Okay. There are some. So in 1955, he actually joined the Boy Scouts and they were sponsored by the Holy Name Society of Mary, Queen of Heaven, Roman Catholic Church. Oh, yeah, I know. Okay. You following? I remember this part. Yes. So he's in the Boy Scouts, right? And doing his little Boy Scout thing. Whatever Boy Scouts do. I don't really know what they do. So there wasn't a whole lot of information on his childhood, just that it was pretty normal. He got average grades. He wasn't like super overly intelligent but wasn't like unintelligent he was just kind of average average so we're gonna skip to when he's about 13 ish in 1953 he actually becomes an eagle scout and when they become an eagle scout they get to have this kind of like ceremony for them And during the ceremony, they said that he would be an elite future leader. Mm. And this kind of went to his head a little bit. Oh, again, shocker. Yeah. So in the same year, with the Eagle Scouts, he actually gets to travel to London to sing for the Queen of England. And while he's there, he receives a kiss from Judy Garland Uh, backstage at the performance. And someone takes a picture of it. Yes. There is a famous picture. So as if he needed any more, you know, props to his ego, Mm -hmm. he gets a kiss from Judy Garland while he's in England. So he decides that he wants to be a priest. Yeah. Weird transition, but okay. Weird transition. So he actually joins the Quigley. I think that's how you pronounce it. (laughs) It Piggly? reminds me of Piggly Wiggly. From <laughs> it, those of you are, who have been to the South or from the South, those are our, our grocery stores in South Carolina. Yeah. Piggly Wigglies. Piggly Wigglies. So he joins the Quigley Preparatory Seminary in Chicago. Seminary? Seminary? Seminary. 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 <laughs> there we go. Got Seminary. you. Seminary. <laughs> this is, since I failed at all of my other jobs with this, that will be my job today. <laughs> Helping you find words that your brain forgets. Yeah. So he decides this is an all boys school. Well, of course it is. (laughs) We're talking about priests here. Of course it's all boy. So this is a private school for boys who are aspiring to be priests. Wait, did we need an extra trigger warning by any chance? No. No? Okay. No. All right. I mean, we are going to talk about some BDSM. So if BDSM freaks you out. Yeah. This isn't for you. Okay. But it's not, it's, I'm not going to go super gross on details. Okay. So he's in this school and he ends up dropping out after one year because he can't keep his grades up and he's getting into fights with all of his classmates and he's spending more time in detention than he is in actual class because he can't keep him, his hands to himself. Very priest-like. Very priest-like. You know, so he drops out after a year and decides, you know what? I'm going to be an x-ray technician. (laughs) What the fuck? (laughs) We're just making all kinds of fucking sense here. So he enrolls at the Morton Junior College for Medical X-ray Technicians. And he drops out after two years. Yep. (laughs) Because he decides... 
I'm going to be a fucking doctor. Oh, no. Another wannabe doctor. Well, the other guy was an actual doctor, but another underachiever who wants to be a doctor. You got it. Yay. So he starts thinking, I'm going to be a doctor. It's fine. Everything's fine. So in 1964, he up and moves to Kansas City. Now he's a grown up at this point? He is a, well, grown up. At this She's point. doing air quotations, if yeah. you couldn't tell by her at voice. At this point, let's do some math. 1943 to 1964. So he's 21? Sure. He's 21. Math sounds right. 21. So, I mean, he's an adult, but he's not like an adult here. Adult. And there was no animal torturing, animal cruelty? Nothing that I could find. Anything on bedwetting? Nope. Okay. Nothing. Okay. I mean, just pretty standard childhood for the 1940s no and 50s. No TBIs? Nothing that I could find. Bullying? I mean, he got into fights a lot. Yeah, okay, so there may have been some bullying there. Okay. But it wasn't said if he was being bullied or if he was the bullier. Uh, good point. But good point. it did say that he did have a high opinion of himself. And then so that, pure aggression. That leads me to think that maybe he was the bullier. Gotcha. Roger, yeah. roger. So, 21, you know, moved to Kansas. 21, moves to Kansas City. And this is where he meets his wife, Nancy Jo Lynch. Now, that sounds like <clears throat> a name from a, someone from Kansas. Nancy Jo. Yeah. Yeah, Nancy Jo. I mean, she's Southern. Let's be real. So, he marries her, and they have their four, first son, John Jr., in 1965. And shortly after that, he starts going out all the time and leaving his wife home alone with her infant son. Mm. Because you know. And he was widely known for being unfaithful to Nancy. Of course. And having girlfriends and going to bars while Nancy's at home taking care of their baby. But he also does something in 1965. Oh, no. He gets a job at the hospital where John Jr. is born, which is the Children's Mercy in General Hospital. And he used fake diplomas and fake recommendation letters from Morton to get a job as an x-ray technician. Oof. And they tell him, and well, and he tells them that he's going to nights, he needs a night job while he's going to medical school mm -hmm. because he's going to be a doctor. Okay. What is with this? <laughs> like, what, of all the jobs that you think you're going to fucking fake your way through, oh, why no, no, a no. medical job? He was soon fired after they figured out that he didn't know what the fuck he was okay. doing. But still, like, why would any person with any... Sl if you have a double-digit IQ, how could you not surmise that that would be a stupid situation to try and, and insert yourself into? He thinks he can do it. Yeah, I, I mean, like from a psychology, let me just ask you to psychology, the mentality of that kind of, because that's what I really, gr I fail to grasp and understand is, is narcissism really so like blinding that they oh, yeah. truly think that they are going to fool people? Think of the people. They think that lowly of us. Think of the people, person that you know, or used to know, who was a narcissist. Christina. <laughs> She's got so many eyebrows going right now. They're Tell like, me. <gasps> yeah. Do they think that lowly but of he, us? But he, the person that, that, that comes to mind, never would have gone this. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking the medical field is. But he did. Not in the medical field, but in other ways. Yeah. He yes. did. It's just he. Okay. John happens to have a very high opinion of himself. He's going to be an elite future leader. Mm -hmm. The Cub Scouts told him so. The Cub Scouts told him so. And he got to go sing for the Queen of England. I okay, mean, he's a big he's, fucking deal. He's a big fucking deal. <laughs> fucking John. But again, can you psychology narcissism in that respect? Like, like <sighs> narcissists truly believe that the way they think and the way that they feel is correct and that they are the most important person. They truly, firmly hold that belief. And nothing you say is going to sway that thought process. Hmm. So he is a narcissist. 
He truly believes that he is smart enough to just do this. He is a fraudster. Mm -hmm. And we will get into that more as we talk about more of his adult life. But he truly believes that he is the shit. I wonder where narcissism ends and, and delusions of grandeur begins, or rather where delusions of grandeur ends and narcissism begins, or if I they don't just know. run I parallel. Think, I think they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. I really do, because I think with narcissism comes delusions of grandeur. Fascinating. <clears throat> All right, anyways, carry on. So they figure out that he's full of shit. He gets fired. Bye, bitch. Meanwhile, he's fucking around on his wife. Everyone knows it. He's a piece of shit. So that takes us to 1969 and his first arrest. He gets a job working at a small medical practice of Dr. Wallace Graham. And he works as an x-ray technician using his forged credentials, right? While he's there, he has sex with multiple staff members and patients and was bragging to Dr. Graham's 15-year-old son about this double life that he's leading. As him being a cheater, an yeah. adulterer? Okay. As him having sex with all these women and he's into BDSM and Ugh. all this nasty shit. Ugh. Meanwhile, he embezzles $33,000 from Dr. Graham's practice. Which is... In today's money, substantial. I mean, that was in 1969. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a substantial amount of money. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of money. Well, he gets arrested for this, and he is only sentenced to three years of probation. Now, this is something that I do know about him, is that he frequently was in trouble with the law and always seems to fucking get by without doing serious time. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he does. And I'll tell you how he does it. Oh, okay. Wait, there's more. There's more. So he gets three years probation. Well, in 1970, he decides, fuck probation. I'm moving back to Chicago. Uproots his family and takes them to Chicago without his um, parole officer's permission. Because that never gets anybody in trouble ever. Nope. And he gets a job at a company called R.B. Jones Company, and he is selling insurance. He's there, he's doing really well, he's good at it. Because he's a bullshitter, he's that's why. He's making good money. So he's probably a natural salesman. Yes. And while he's there, he knocks poor Nancy Joe up again, and they end up having fraternal twins, Christopher and Christine. Super creative. But that same year, he does it again and gets arrested for embezzling money from his company. So he manages to get himself out of this by agreeing to pay restitution. And he gets sent back to Kansas City where he gets in trouble for breaking his probation and his probation just gets extended. Why? why he doesn't go to jail, he just gets extended. I don't understand. He's agreeing to pay the money back. But it's... Uh, so I guess that's how uh, he's getting out of it. I don't really know. That's bullshit. <clears throat> that's horse shit. Yeah. So then he gets in trouble again in 1975 when he has charges of security and mail fraud in connection with a phony, quote unquote, medical consulting company that he forms. Oh, so now he's actually starting like scam artist oh, companies. Yeah. He's actually hired by the University of Kansas Medical Center as a business consultant and then was let go after people start going, what the fuck? Because he's asking for the company checkbook. Oh my God. And they're like, yeah, no, bro. Mm -mm, mm -mm. This brings, this, this is what delusion, this is the definition of what delusional is. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So during all of this, right, all of this is going on, and he is doing something that is very Gacy-esque, okay. if you will. During all of this, he is building up this persona of being an upstanding member of the community. Mm. He becomes a scoutmaster, a baseball coach, and a Sunday school teacher. Of course. For a Presbyterian church. He's fucking Catholic. 
but he's a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher because that makes sense. So it sounds like he really likes to be idolized. Oh, he is full of himself. Mm. He is so full of shit, it's coming out his ears. Ew. So in 1977, he talks his way onto the board of directors of a local charitable organization and forged a series of letters from its executive director to the mayor of Kansas City and other civic leaders. And these letters praise him for being such a generous volunteer. God, and just outst- what he needs. An outstanding member of the community. And eventually he names himself oh as God. the organization's man of the year. And I'm throws- reading her notes along, so like I'm getting some of it before she's saying it. And it's just cracking and me up. And throws a luncheon in his own honor. Oh that is something that fucking Michael from The Office would 100% yes. do. So this fucking- dude oh thinks he is such the king shit that he names himself. Man of the year, and then throws himself his own party. I wonder if there was a party planning committee. I mean, maybe. Maybe he has Dwight. (laughs) Dwight. Dwight. So, yeah, this dude is full of bullshit, and in 1979, his probation is over, right? Mm -hmm. Probation's over. He's free and clear. I mean, I would think that maybe he would take all this upstanding man of the year shit and actually do something with it yeah but which is crazy because like he's succeeding at doing what he wants to do which is getting this attention and being an upstanding member of society like the the gratification that he wants he's receiving so why not just continue to do the right thing because he's a piece of shit he's still a piece of garbage a fraudster okay 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 so what does he do next so He only lasts one year (laughs) of good behavior. Because in 1980, he's arrested again. For, Um, let me guess, embezzlement? Embezzlement and check forgery. There you go. But this time, he actually gets 60 days in jail. Oh, my God. Yeah. People who get charged, not that this is okay, but people who get charged with, like, minor drug possession spend more time in jail than that. And this guy is, like... Thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars oh, from companies. Yeah. So <sighs> around this time, he also forms a hydroponics business. Okay. And it's bullshit. It's not real. But he gets a friend to loan him. Oh my 20, god! I remember this part. Twenty-five thousand dollars. And this friend, his wife, is terminally ill yeah. and is dying. And he loans this money to John, thinking that he's going to get a fast investment return and they'll be able to pay off all the bills that have come up from his wife needing so much medical care. Mm -hmm. John just took his money. Like, he fucking didn't do anything. He wasn't running a legitimate business. He was literally just taking money from his friends. Definitely lacking in empathy. No empathy. Interesting. No Interesting. Okay. So he also, around this time, begins sexually propositioning the neighbor's wives, as you do. Now, he's got all this money coming in, right? They live in a upper middle class neighborhood in a nice house. His wife has no idea. How, are you kidding me? No, she has, like, I... she doesn't wonder about the probation or any of no. that stuff? This bit, bitch be dumb. Either she doesn't fucking know what's going on. Or she a liar. Or she's got her head buried in the sand. Or I don't know. But he starts hitting on all the neighbor's wives and actually gets into a fist fight with one of the husbands over it. Hmm. He also joins a secret BDSM cult. This one Here is an, we go. This one is an actual cult. It's called the International Council of Masters. And mm. he becomes one of the slave masters there. And his duties include luring victims to gatherings to be tortured and raped by cult, cult members. Okay, so this isn't consensual play. No, no. And I was watching um, a video on him. It was actually the one I sent you. And mm-hmm. in the inner... In, the video a member of the bdsm community 
says that he was throwing up red flags because he was calling himself a master. Yeah, I've I've heard that. And that, that that's not actually real what they do. BDSM masters would never refer to themselves in that way. Yeah. Okay. And that that was a humongous red, red flag. flag. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Because people who are true dominance or masters in that culture have a lot of respect for their submissives Mm -hmm. and the submissive is really the one who holds most of the power in those relationships so the fact that he was calling himself a slave master and was involved in this quote-unquote cult was not part of the BDSM culture that is normal and consensual and regular people yeah. living their lives. See, that's why we always bring it up. Whenever this does come up with a serial killer, why we always comment or commentate on how strange and abnormal and it not being like that in these subcultures, it's because it's true. And I don't ever want to set the tone that the stuff isn't okay because it well and truly, when it's two consenting adults, it's totally fine. Oh, and yeah. Every time it gets brought up, I'm always going to say that because I never, never, never want those people to feel ashamed or shamed or have any more bullshit attached to their name. This is just one fucked up individual, individual. taking advantage of an entire community. Yes. Okay. There. So There's my default response. That's all the shit he's doing. So in 1984, we're just moving right along here. He starts two more fraudulent shell companies. They're called Equa Plus and Equa Two. And this is where shit starts getting serious. He hires Paula Godfrey, who is 19, to work as a sales rep for his company, Equa Plus. Godfrey told her friends and family that John was sending her away for training. Well, her parents and her family know that she's supposed to be going away from, for training, but they don't hear from her. Like, mm-hmm. they don't hear it at all from her. She just, like, falls off the face of the earth. So they go ahead and file a missing persons report. So, you know, the police know that Paula is supposed to be with John. So they go and question him. But he denies any knowledge of knowing what happened. I don't know where she went. She was supposed to go for training, but I don't fucking know where she went. She just left. Several days after this... The family gets a typewritten letter, but Paula had signed the bottom of the letter with her signature. And in this letter, she states that she was fine, she was okay, but she didn't want to see her family anymore. Oh, he must have typed, he must have had her sign a bunch of stuff beforehand. So this letter is typed, but it's her signature. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So her mom tells the police, well, like, it doesn't really sound like my daughter, but it is her signature, yeah. so I don't know. So the police in- terminate the investigation because Godfrey was a legal adult. She can do. There what she was wants. no evidence of wrongdoing. She has doing. the right to go. She missing has the if right to go to. missing if yeah. she wants. Well, Paula was never found. No idea what happened to her. She's gone. How does he go from embezzling to murder? Did he? Is this when he discovered the internet? No, not yet. Hmm. So. In 1985, the next year, he decides he's going to start using the alias John Osborne. And John meets Lisa Stacy. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her last name, and I'm really sorry if it's not. S-T-A-S-I. I think that looks Stacey. like Stacy. And Lisa has a four-month-old little girl named Tiffany. Oh, God. So they were actually at a battered woman's shelter in Kansas City. Well, John promised Lisa that he would get her a job in Chicago, he would get her an apartment, and help her with daycare. So she agrees. She wants a better life for herself and her daughter. So she goes. And while she's with John, he has her sign several pieces of blank stationery. Okay, yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking. And Lisa calls her mother-in-law, Betty and says that they, quote-unquote, they, told her she was not a fit mother and that Betty wanted to get custody of Tiffany, her baby. Uh So poor Lisa thinks that her mother-in-law is trying to take her baby away from her. And she's really, really upset about it. Betty talks her down and says, that's not true. We don't want to take the baby. We just want to get you the help you need. You know, Mm -hmm. we want to help you. Lisa then says, they're coming, and hangs up the phone. The fuck? 
And those are the last words that Lisa's family ever hears from her. Well, later, John contacts his brother and sister-in-law, who just so happened to be trying to adopt a baby, and claims he knew of a baby whose mother had just committed suicide. And you are fucking kidding me. Well, set him up with a lawyer who, if they just pay $5,500 to this lawyer, he killed this woman for $5,500 mm-hmm. and took her baby and gave oh. it to somebody else. And Don and Helen Robinson, John's brother and sister in law, received Tiffany Stassi with legal looking adoption papers signed by two fake lawyers and a judge. He murdered this woman for $5,500. Lisa was never heard from again. And here's the most fucked up part. Don and Helen have no idea yeah, that this they adoption think they're is doing not an legit. Ama- I mean, that's not on they them. They literally think they're adopting they think they're doing an this amazing- tiny little wow. baby. What kind? Oh my God, and that is infuriating. And little Tiffany Sassy, her identity was confirmed by DNA in 2000. My God. So, like, they know legit that this baby is that not poor girl. who they're suppo- who it's supposed to be. Yeah. How is she our age then, probably? Um, yeah, probably around our age. Could you fucking imagine? She was four months old in 1985. So not she's... that, like, she could ever blame her parents, her no, adoptive parents, no. but, like, oh my God. Yeah. That is some Tom fuckery. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, Jesus. So in 1987, Catherine Clampett, who is 27, left her child with her parents in Wichita Falls, Texas. Oh no, is this a theme? And goes to Kansas City to look for employment. And that's when she meets John Robinson. Robinson. He promises her extensive traveling and a new wardrobe if she will come and work for him. Well, she vanished in June of 1987 and her missing person case remains open. But her kid was left with family. <clears throat> her kid was left with family. I mean, not, I'm just trying to make sure. Yes, I have all the no. Details. Her child was left with her parents, so her child was safe. But she just vanishes off the face of the earth, like the other ones have. Mm-hmm. So between the years of 1987 and 1993, John is incarcerated on multiple fraud convictions in Kansas City and in Missouri. So. While in prison, he meets and befriends the prison librarian, who is called Beverly Bonner. I don't think that's pronounced Boner. I'm pretty (laughs) sure it's Bonner. I'm going to go with Bonner. I'm going to go with Bonner. She's 49, and he tells her, you know, I can offer you so many great opportunities and, you know, promises her the world, basically. So once he gets out of prison, meanwhile, Nancy is sticking with his ass this entire fucking time. Uh, He's yeah, still yeah. married with Delusional his three children. Women. So he gets out and Beverly leaves her husband and moves to Kansas City to work for John. Does she leave her husband for John or she's oh, leaving? No, she leaves her husband for John. Like to be in a relationship, not just leaves her husband to Mm -hmm. go work for him well she goes to work for him but i think she also goes to be with him i think it's a little bit of both so john arranges for her alimony checks to go to a p.o box in kansas city oh no her family never hears from her again and john continues to cash her alimony checks how has his wife lasted this long i guess i don't fucking know she i Mm. Maybe, mm. well, he's got to keep mm. a, up a facade of normal. Normalcy. I'm sure. He's definitely living a double life. So by 1994, John has discovered the internet. And I'm sure everything explodes. It 100% explodes. So he starts roaming the various social networking sites, and he is using the name Slave Master. Blah, blah, blah. And so uncomfortable. He's looking for women who enjoy playing submissive partner roles during sex. So all those horror stories we heard growing up about these disgusting men on the internet. Come true. Come true. I mean, this is like my childhood nightmare come to life. So his first online victim is Sheila Faith, 
who was 45. And she had a 15-year-old daughter named Debbie who was confined to a wheelchair because she has spina bifida. Mm -hmm. John portrays himself as a wealthy man who could support them and give Sheila a job and help Debbie with all of her treatments. So he constantly tries to, he lures women in with this knight in shining armor whole spiel. Yeah, essentially. Gotcha. So in 1994, Sheila and Debbie moved from California to Kansas City and promptly disappear. John, oh, both, both of them, both do? of them. Fuck this dude. John continues to cash Sheila's pension checks for seven oh years. Oh my God. Somebody fuck him in the eye with an ice pick. So at this point, John is pretty well known in the popular BDSM online chat rooms, right? He's well fucking known. He's there all the goddamn time. Meanwhile, he's still keeping up this double life with Nancy. Like, I don't know how she hasn't caught on to this, but she hasn't. Or if she did, she didn't give a shit. I don't really know. Yeah. I can't figure it out. So in 1999... John meets Isabella Lewicka, Lewicka, who's 21 and is a Polish immigrant. John offers her a job. Did he meets her on the internet? He meets her online. Okay. He offers her a job and a bondage relationship. So she's a submissive. Mm -hmm. She willingly moves from Indiana to Kansas City, thinking that she's going to be in a relationship with John as well as having a job. John gives her an engagement ring and takes her to the courthouse to file for a marriage license. While still being married While to Nancy. While still being married to Nancy. So they never pick up this marriage license, but I don't know if Isabella legitimately thought that they were married. I don't know. Mm. But their marriage certificate was never filed. So... Isabella tells her whole family that she's married, but doesn't tell them who her husband is. Like, never gives them a name, nothing. So, John gets her to sign a 115-item, quote-unquote, slave contract. Which is probably an actual real binding contract. Mm -hmm. That actually gives John pretty much total control over her entire life, including her bank account. Okay, Christian Grey. Don't put that evil on Christian Grey. Other than the fact that he's the shittiest main character of a story ever, <laughs> Twilight fan fiction. But oh I God. digress. I digress. So in the summer of 1999, she disappears. And John said that she had been caught smoking marijuana and had been reported. <gasps> she was smoking the marijuana? The marijuana. The marijuana? <laughs> my God. Oh, clutching my pearls. I do declare. So at the same time as Isabella's disappearance... John convinces Suzette Troughton to move from Michigan to Kansas. She is an LPN and is also a submissive. And she actually, like, is in the BDSM community as a submissive. So John tells her that they're going to travel the world together and have this bondage relationship. So Suzette's mother receives several typed letters from Suzette. And these letters were supposedly sent from other countries, but are all postmarked out of Kansas City. Really? <laughs> this fucking dumbass. Like, they're all postmarked in Kansas City. And then, to top it off, Suzette's mother goes, why the fuck is she typing a letter, first yeah. of all? But Wait, they what all, year is this again? But they all, <laughs> yeah. But they all have Suzette's signature. Like, she wrote out, love you, Suzette. Mm -hmm. on the letters so clearly he's still having women just sign random pieces of paper yeah and the letters were all perfectly typed no mistakes and Suzette's mom is like that's not Suzette <laughs> my daughter's I grammar by my is daughter by her grammar <laughs> and her spelling is not great I know that this is not from her well John tells Suzette's mother that she ran off with another man after stealing money from him Oh, you poor victim. So he is playing the victim through all of this, right? But during this time, he manages to attract the attention of the police in both Kansas and Missouri. And I wonder fucking why all these women are going missing and they're 
all connected to him in some way. And nobody's like, pourquoi? So the police are like, hmm, this is suspicious. Maybe we should look into this guy. Je ne sais pas. <clears throat> Je ne sais quoi. What am I saying? So March 1st of 2000, John begins sending money to a psychologist in Texas named Vicky. The police are very suspicious of him at this point and are tapping his phone. So they're very well aware of his dealings with Vicky. So this fucking psychologist is meeting up with this dude and she doesn't get immediate oh, red she's flags. she's unemployed. She's an unemployed, depressed psychologist in Texas. I should note that. Can but I no, just say... She doesn't... What is with you psychology people... And not you in particular. Mm-hmm. You are perfect mm-hmm. in every <laughs> shape and form. But I have noticed a trend here <laughs> that, like, people who do psychology either are doing great or mm-hmm. not so great. Or terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what is yeah, that yeah. they say about teachers? Oh, yeah. Um, those who cannot do teach or the... Something like that. Something like that. I don't know. What Whatever. Don't is. ask me things. Car revving Car down the revving Excuse, down the street. Do you not realize that we're trying to do a fucking murder podcast? Excuse you, sir. Yeah. Excuse Jesus. you. Oh my god. Really? Stop with the your. What do you drive? Like a fucking Nissan? Stop. I bet it's a Civic. Ugh. It probably is a Civic. <laughs> uh. So. Anyways, sorry. The police are tapping John's phone, and they're well aware of his dealings with Vicky. So Vicky comes to visit him over the Easter weekend and John puts her up in a hotel. Police get the room next to theirs because they're like they're watching John Mm -hmm. and they hear him having very rough sex with Vicky and hear that she is being forced into sexual acts that she was not even that okay with. Okay. He took photos of her while she was all tied up was smacking her around harder than what had been agreed upon. And she had not agreed to photos being taken of her. She was not okay with it. So that, at this point, is sexual battery, right? Mm -hmm. So John sends good old Vicky back to Texas and tells her to await his instructions. As a submissive, as a sub, who the guy already violates the terms of your contract, wouldn't your red flags go way way up I don't know yeah I mean you would think so but carry on so then in May of 2000 John meets Gianna and she's an accountant who is also from Texas and he she comes to Kansas City to work as John's executive assistant so this chick is an accountant and she's gonna come to Kansas City to work for this motherfucker as an executive assistant That makes no goddamn sense. Mm. John puts her up in the exact same hotel as Vicky, leaves her there for several days, and then when he comes back, proceeds to beat the shit out of her for not being naked and positioned in the corner of the room when he arrives. Wait, is Joanna, is is she a submissive? Is she involved in this at all? It didn't say if she was exactly involved in the BDSM community, but I'm pretty sure she knew what she was getting into. He is advertising. I mean, at least she had expectations of. He is advertising himself as a slave master. Okay. I just didn't know if this was like an actual accountant that he had come across and was hiring. Okay. 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 So he then has violent sex with her and takes photos. And in these photos, her body is bruised badly. Like he has beat the shit out of her. He then gives her $100 and sends her home. This is in 2000. 100 bucks is like fucking nothing. nothing. He instructs her to put all of her belonging, belongings in storage and come back. Oh, that's not a good sign at all. She follows through. Oh, my God. And comes back, but is really fearful of his rough treatment. She's what? not okay with this. What? What? Okay. So, in June of 2000, the cops show up at John's farm in La Cigna, Kansas. And I probably just butchered La Cigna. I'm so sorry. Because Vicky and Gianna filed sexual, sexual battery complaints against him. At least they did that. These girls are like, this shit's fucked up. 
it's not cool, it needs to not happen again, and they file police reports. Well, the property was searched, and they have cadaver dogs out there, right? Because they don't know what they're going to find. They're just searching his property. And the detectives stumble across these barrels, right? And they go to move these barrels, and blood starts leaking out of them. Is this the first mention of the farm? Like, I don't remember you talking about a farm at all. During all of this time, they move around. Like, Uh they're in the same city, but they're constantly upgrading houses. Okay. And buying this property and buying that property. And he buys 30 acres out in the middle of fucking nowhere. Oh, okay. Okay? So, they're... they're on the property that he now owns with Nancy and his children. Like, he's still living this double life. Like, Nancy Ugh. is still with him. She's still involved. Like, everything is still cool. So they go and they arrest him and they find these barrels and they find two decaying bodies inside of these barrels on his property. Mm. And the bodies are identified as Isabel and Suzette. So while this is going on, there is a storage facility in Missouri that John rents two garages in. And the cops go and search those two garages, and they find three more chemical drums containing bodies. And in those drums were Beverly, Sheila, and Debbie. And is that all of the girls that are now accounted for? No. No? There's eight girls and five bodies have been found. Oh. So, and Sheila and Debbie, that's the mother and daughter. Oh, yeah. Debbie's the 15-year-old. Yeah, okay. So, all five women were all killed in the same way, and that was blunt force trauma to their head. So, he obviously has done fucked up, and the cops have evidence yeah, like he's true he, he must be done for at this. he's done for okay so Good. by 2002 after the trial and all of that robinson is sentenced to death in kansas for the murders and life imprisonment for the deaths of the women now kansas had not reinstated the death penalty when lisa was murdered so he got life imprisonment for her but the death penalty for the others. Oh, good. Oh, uh, oh is that not uh, not good? It's just, it's just it's weird. weird. It's, it's just, weird. just weird. So because if you think of where Kansas City is, right? There's Kansas City, Kansas, mm-hmm. and Kansas City, Missouri. Mm-hmm. But I think on the map they're like right next to each other, aren't they? Uh, sure. So that sounds right. Anyways. You know, he's facing a legal battle in Kansas, but he's also facing a legal battle in Missouri. So prosecutors in Missouri are actively pursuing additional murder charges because, you know, he has three bodies stashed in that state as well. Well, John's attorneys are fighting this because Missouri is like, fuck you, bitch. We're going to kill you now. Mm-hmm. Like they're much more strict with murder charges in Missouri than they are in Kansas. So the prosecutor in Missouri, Chris Coster, he insists as a condition of any plea bargain that John has to come and lead the authorities to the bodies of Lisa Stassi, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett, who they can't find their bodies. Okay. Right? So, but doing so would have meant that John was admitting guilt, which he is not doing. He didn't kill these girls. He oh, doesn't know what they're talking about. I fucking just ooh, I hate the the serial killers that I fucking hate more than any other ones are the ones that do this shit. Mm-hmm. Like, ooh, because when you have somebody like Kemper, not to put Kemper on a pedestal, but he knew what he did. He, he knew it was wrong. He admitted what he did. And he has adamantly said that he should never be allowed out of prison. Like, I, I can level with that mm-hmm. to a certain degree. You know what I mean? Like, it, 
it makes the coping part easier. Not that this has anything to do with my coping or anybody else's coping. It's 100% their selfish, disgusting creatures. But like it makes them so much worse that even that even, even when they're caught with bodies on their property literally red handed they still cannot see past their own ego mm-hmm. to admit defeat yep ah. So ah. john is like yeah no i'm not doing that so coster realizes that they're never gonna find these other women without john like they're mm-hmm. never gonna be able to find these poor women so they decide to offer him this plea deal where he would acknowledge that Coster had enough evidence to convict him for the murder of Godfrey, Clampett, Bonner, and the Faiths. But the plea deal did not have any specific language that was like an acceptance of responsibility. So in the plea deal, he could say like, yeah, I know Coster has enough evidence to convict me, but I'm still not saying I did it. We need to pause. This is frustrating. (laughs) How does this happen? I don't know. This is the 2000s. Oh, yeah. This is like 2002 right now. Okay. Let me... I'm stress eating. I'm stressed out. Okay. So... Remember, he's already on death row. He's been sentenced to death, Mm -hmm. okay? So in 2005, Nancy finally fucking files for divorce. Oh, good. After 41 years of marriage, she finally is like, I should divorce him. (laughs) It's serious now. He fucking murdered people. (laughs) Nancy, why? God damn it, Nancy. So this is where it gets even more sad. In 2006, Lisa Stassi's daughter, who is now known as Heather Robinson because she's been adopted, right, by John's brother and sister-in-law. She filed a suit against the Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, which involved the social worker Karen Gaddis. And Gaddis is the one who had told John about Lisa and her newborn daughter Tiffany in 1984 when John told Gaddis that he was looking for women for his fictional home for quote-unquote unwed mothers of white babies. So he was running a fraud for unwed mothers of white babies and a social worker didn't question this shit and just told him about a girl who was in trouble, who happened to have a baby. That's fucked up. So Tiffany slash Heather won the settlement in 2007, and it wasn't said how much money she got, anything like that. They just reached a settlement, and she split the sum with her biological grandmother, Patricia Sylvester. So sad. And that's all she wrote john robinson is still on death row in kansas city he's still alive that motherfucker's still not dead it is 2020 he, the when was this he got in 2006 you said the girl filed the suit oh he was put in jail in 2002 that's when he was sentenced our to taxes are paying for that motherfucker to still be i'm sorry if you guys if anybody listening to this is against the death penalty i am 75% for it, and in this circumstance, I don't feel like we're going to benefit by dissecting his brain, which we're not allowed to do anyway, so I think he should be fucking killed. Sorry. I think when there is indisputable evidence, like, without a shadow of a doubt, he fucking did it, just public execution, chop his head off, bring back the guillotine, mm-hmm. let's just get it over with. It just folks and steaks and pitchforks (laughs) your your steak and fork (laughs) your steak and fork jeffrey dahmer (laughs) i don't know i don't know but we are never going to be able to be monetized just so you're aware like do you know know how much editing we're going to have to do to ourselves to be monetized 
YouTube will never like us. No. We'll lit- literally the only w- way that we will ever be able to make any sort of pennies from this is after enough people possibly listen and they're like, well, we'll pay for you to be horrible on Patreon. Yeah. But like YouTube's never going to do it. None no. of the podcast places are It's a are good ever- thing we really enjoy doing this. Yeah, I know. Well, in 2001... A book was written about John and his victims, and it's called The Internet Slave Master. And it covers his life from birth until he was convicted. And there are documentaries. Well, uh, Chelsea did send me one. There's plenty of stuff on YouTube. I just didn't get or I just didn't get to it. I like I said, I opened my photography studio this week. Shit's been crazy. Shit's um, been crazy. Uh, he I was supposed to finish my notes on him today. And it just didn't happen. So this was kind of cool to, like, learn about it as you went. Not going to lie. Yeah. Um, It was kind of cool. I mean, this dude is a real piece of shit. He's a real piece of shit. He's a real piece of shit. I mean, not only was he killing these poor women, he was... He brought their. He was some defrauding of their, them too, yeah, and like, killed some of their children in the process. Uh, I mean, and we only have the eight women. Like, mm-hmm. who knows... If there were others that, you know, weren't as well known or anything like that. Yeah. Well, uh, palate cleanser. So I I think I need a palate cleanser because this this just irritated me on so many fucking. Ooh. Anyways, palate cleanser. This This is is a palate palate cleanser. cleanser. What do you guys think of our theme song for Ballot Cleanser? Isn't it isn't it nice? Are you liking it? Do you love it? Do you love it? Do you want more? <laughs> so everybody loves us weird girls right up until we start doing weird, weird girl shit. I say to my cat as we watch a documentary about serial killers in our matching onesie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. All right, here's a good one. Kid, mom. What's dark humor? Mom, do you see that man over there without arms? Tell him to clap. Kid, mom, I'm blind. Exactly. Oh my God. I hate small talk. I want to talk about aliens, the 16 digits on your credit card, and three numbers on the back, and the expiration date. (laughs) Coworker, can I add you on Facebook? Me. Not unless everyone gets real cool about a bunch of shit real quick. When you're inner, it's, it's... A picture of um, Fester Adams. It's a picture of Fester Adams. And it says, when your inner dark humor accidentally comes out in front of someone, that wasn't me. (laughs) Oh my god. It's a picture of uh, the vampire from Stephen King's book. And it says, waiting to drop some dope serial killer facts on some unsuspecting people. (laughs) Oh my god, this is a picture of Mike Wazowski. Mike Wazowski. And it says, me and friend's car plays music. My friend, clean music only. There's a child in the trunk. Child screaming. (laughs) Have you ever seen Abducted in Plain Sight? I can't with that show. Like, Uh, I was screaming at the fuck at my TV. So it's one that says, When you look away for three seconds during abducted in plain sight and the dad starts talking about jerking the kidnapper off. Bitch, what the fuck? What? That show had me so fucking confused. I wanted to beat the fuck out of those parents. Like, worst parents fucking ever. How can you? Oh, God. I'm, this episode is making me sound so aggressive. This is what happens when I don't research beforehand. Like, I don't get time to diffuse my anger out. You don't get time to decompress. It is, but you know what though? It is really frustrating. Like, I was researching this dude, and you know, Shipman didn't piss me off. Like, I mean, he disturbed me, and it was definitely a like, what the fuck is happening? But this guy, oh my god, I was like, and then he did what? And then he did what? And then he fucking did what?
one of these days we'll do the bigs we'll do kemper we'll do Dahmer, we'll do bundy we'll do btk like one of these days we'll get around we just to don't doing feel those. like we're there enough yet no we want to grow our audience a little bit more before we do those guys i feel like they because the crimes they did were so horrific i feel like they really deserve a lot more of our time and attention yeah whenever we say they deserve we don't we don't mean the killer itself no deserves we, we mean, mean the story the, the trauma victims, the, the trauma, victims the and they deserve more of our time because those crimes are so big there's a lot more known about their victims and a lot mm. more known about their psychology and that is something that that's what we care about mm -hmm. not the killers themselves but the psychology and dissecting like what the fuck happened mm -hmm. like why did this happen and why were those victims chosen yeah and my greatest my the thing that i always want to take away from all these years of being interested in, in forensics and true crime and serial killers is things that you can do and conversations that you can have that potentially maybe they don't but maybe they will influence others to not to, to think critically about trauma. Yeah. And to think critically about identifying red flags. Well, my whole To make away, the world a better fucking like, place. My whole takeaway from this is like, this is how you create a serial killer. Yeah. The trauma and not and not to say that everyone who has experienced childhood trauma is going no, to grow but up the, to do horrible but things. But let, let's just say that right now, we don't ever speak in extremes no. anyways. No, we don't. But when we say like, this is how you create a serial killer, this is how you fucking create a serial killer. Yeah. And I think it brings awareness to childhood trauma and awareness to how important mental health is and how important mental health care is. I mean, look at Richard Trenton Chase. Mm -hmm. He was an absolute failure of the family and the system. I mean, his family knew there was something wrong with him. They knew he was schizophrenic. They knew he was a danger to himself and to others. And if you just And they did nothing about it. And then the medical system knew he was a danger, knew he was in trouble, and released him anyway. And then he murdered all those people in a very short amount of time. And he was schizophrenic. There was something very, very wrong with, with his brain. And he wasn't medicated because his mother took him off the medication. And if you haven't listened to our episode on the vampire of Sacramento, you absolutely should because it goes into exactly what we're talking about. The uh, impacts of mental illness mm -hmm. on those who are in danger of going off the deep end. Yeah, the the people that are more suscept susceptible to mental illness because the reality is you can paint all the serial killers with the same brush and say they were born evil, they were born to kill mm -hmm. and not go any deeper and then you do nothing to solve the problem. You do right. nothing to bring awareness to something that there is a very good potential can that it can be prevented to some degree. I mean, we don't All have the answers. All it takes is some intervention. Yeah. So I I hear a lot about people getting flack for being interested in true crime and serial killers and all of that stuff. And to me personally, while I can see from the victim's perspective um, how it's gross to them mm -hmm. and, and they, they deem it a lot as idolization and all of that, I don't see it that way. And I think level-headed, healthy people don't see it that way. Of, cor of course, there are people who take it to extremes that are not healthy about it. But I think people like us who only just want to have a fucking conversation about how... How the fuck this happened. And, and what you can do to make the world a better place and be a better parent. And, and not to mention only noticing red flags in your daily life. Too. Yeah, seriously. Like, this is the shit you need to be watching for. Don't be a victim. Mm -hmm. And not to say that these victims are at fault because absolutely no, I'm not victim no, no, shaming. No, 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 I'm no. just saying like, you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's so much. There's so much gray area. But regardless, I still think that these podcasts, these books, all of that stuff do have a role to play. And I do think it is a, an important one. Mm -hmm. I mean, just me, myself and learning what I have in the time that we've the fucking car guy is back. Oh my god. 
um, in the time that we've done this stuff, I've learned it's helped me identify things that, you know, when I have conversations with other people, I like to share it. Yeah. Well, and I think that because we haven't done the the big guys, quote unquote, mm-hmm. the big guys, like we focused more on like we do do a well-known serial killer here, you know, every couple of weeks. But we do try to find guys that we didn't know about mm-hmm. the fucking weirdos that and i think it's fascinating to find the commonalities you know how many how time how many times so far have we compared several serial killers together that had commonalities oh i know there's been a lot i mean we do try to say like oh like so and so oh like so and so oh like so and so you know oh there's a commonality there's a ding 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 there's another red flag who did that that we know yeah I'm just fascinating. Little 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 trickles of, of interesting facts. So let me ask you. Where does this douche canoe fall on the Dahmer scale for you? So his body count is estimated to be eight, right? Yep, but only five confirmed. And he tortured, raped, and killed them. Well, we don't know if he tortured, raped, and killed them. We can assume he did. Uh, well, it sounds like there was a lot of unconsensual... Yeah. I mean, I'm going to assume that he probably tortured and raped these girls. I'm going to put him at a seven. A seven? Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. He was a pretty gigantic dirtbag. Piece of shit. Well, piece of shit. I hope that you get the death sentence real soon. So, yeah. If you have any commentary, feel free to drop us a message on Facebook, Instagram, at the killer t and we're now on twitter at the killer t and you can also leave us a email if you want at the killer t at gmail.com or send us a voice message when you listen on spotify or anchor yeah you can send us a voice message and we'll definitely listen to it we're here for all fuckery <laughs> all right y'all until next week bye. bye join us next week where we discuss the unknown cleveland, cleveland torso, torso murder Welcome to the episode 12 of fucking Killer T. On today's episode, we will be doing John Edward Robinson, the fucking slave master. Fuck. What? You don't like that one? No. No, No, that one's not acceptable? Christina, sexy phone operator voice. On today's episode... (laughs) What is happening? (laughs) We're getting slap happy. That's what's happening. We cannot be slap happy for this piece of shit, okay? We can't. I mean, maybe that's that's how I cope with it. I don't know. On today's episode, I've already fucked it up. Welcome to episode 12 of The Killer Team. Welcome to episode 12 of The Killer Team. Welcome to episode 12 of the Killer Team. Welcome to Christina trying to do her intro for a fucking hour before she finally goes, you just fucking do it. No, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it right this